There are those who see the devil as the great deceiver, as the adversary of truth. In Dishonored, the outsider is viewed through a similar lens, as a devil who manipulates his way into the hearts of the weak. The Abbey of the Everyman, the major religious power in the world of Dishonored, considers worship of him anathema, believing themselves to be the sole bulwark standing between the realms of men and this beguiling figure. But we know better, do we not? This devil doesn't lie to get his way. No, he tells the truth, the literal truth. He boons select few with his gifts simply for a lark, and shows his chosen that there are no lakes of fire in the world beyond, just a void. And in this void, there are no demons, no sinners being tormented for succumbing to primal urges. No, the ones here are the sinless. They are the true victims in the world of dishonored. They are the whales. In this new multi-part series, we will be examining the evocative lore behind the game of Dishonored and piecing together the mysterious connections between the Outsider, the Void, and the Whales. In this first video, I will be primarily focusing on the Outsider, examining significant textual pieces found in-game and externally. However, I will occasionally theorize on the more nebulous aspects of the mythos, since there are many blank spaces fragmenting the backstory of this incredible character. So, kick back and enjoy episode one my Dishonored Lore series. Though there are many who would liken the Outsider to the Abrahamic Satan, he actually bears more of a similarity to Loki, the trickster god of Norse mythology. This isn't to say he's a perfect analogy for him. In truth, the Outsider is actually an amalgamation of more than one mythical figure, such as the aforementioned Satan and another, which we'll discuss later on. In the context of the God of Discord, he is an intriguing counterpart. Like Loki, the Outsider has a penchant for causing havoc and upheaval, all for his own amusement. Like Loki, the Outsider is also spawned the union of two lovers. However, unlike Loki, the Outsider was not born a supernatural entity, but a man. According to the Dunwall archives, he was born some 3,000 years before the year zero, an epic which marked the end of an event known as the Great Burning. This moment in history was commemorated as the onset of the modern calendar, as the first day of the month of Earth, and is still honored to this day. Sadly, there is no in-game text which details the Outsider's life as a human. However, back in 2014, Dishonored's writer and director, Harvey Smith, took to Twitter and provided some tantalizing tidbits about his early years. According to Smith, the Outsider was born, quote, poor and outcast, and suffered at the hands of the powerful." Unquote. He was an orphan, with no known family, which neither confirms nor denies the possibility of him having a sibling or siblings. Smith saying that the outsider suffered at the hands of the powerful could mean a whole host of things, some of which may tie together with his parentage. Consider this, it's possible that the outsider was a bastard sired by a member of the nobility or even the royal family. Perhaps his mother was a prostitute or maybe a handmaid and she was abandoned after being impregnated. Though Smith stated that the human outsider was orphaned, he also said that he had, quote unquote, no known family. This statement has interesting implications, essentially stating that whoever his family were, they either played no part in his life and were forgotten to time, or that they might have had some dealings with the human outsider, but all records of their existence were expunged from history. Either way, the outsider remained human until the age of 15. It was around this point in his life when he became the target of an occultist group that sought to use him in one of their rituals. The exact purpose of this ritual isn't explicitly stated, but according to Smith, it had something to do with becoming one with the Void. It also seems the Outsider was chosen as their sacrifice due to certain qualifying factors, such as his age, as well as, quote, his resemblance to bits of prophecy, celestial movements, and solo events like the mass dying of a bunch of fish, unquote. During the rite, the human outsider was, quote, bathed and dressed, and his hands were adorned with rings, unquote. To the astute observer, these are the same rings he wears during the events of the game. The specifics of what happened next aren't provided, but according to Smith, the ritual resulted with the human outsider's form merging, quote, in part with the void, unquote, effectively creating the being we meet 4,837 years later in Dishonored. Whether or not this was the goal of the occultist can't be determined. Yes, we know they sought to merge a human with the Void, but to what end? Were they acolytes of the Void who sought to commune with their god through a representative? 
or were they simply tools of the void itself, being manipulated by its will? According to Smith, the void could be interpreted as a conscious being. He describes it as having, quote, many strange properties, hungering for a representational godlike entity, unquote. This isn't the first time we see the void anthropomorphized as being hungry. This descriptor is used in the book The Hungry Cosmos by Anton Sokolov, in which the natural philosopher refers to the void as a, quote, hungry nexus, unquote, theorizing that all cosmic bodies are eventually consumed by it. Smith also states that when it lacks a figurehead, quote, the void essentially spawns another. The primal forces shift and align, creating the right conditions for the birth of a new divinity, unquote. The language here is simple but cryptic, leaving us to decipher their meaning. What are these primal forces? Smith does not provide a sense of space, so we don't know where it takes place, and since the nature of the void is so alien, it makes it impossible to understand if and how the process may differ in a universe like our own. Are we led to believe that the void births its representative through wefting energies and matter? Is this figurehead created through the same process which leads to galaxies forming here in our own universe? Or is it frequency-based, some foreign melody from beyond vibrating across the abyss and taking shape? We already know that music plays a part in the arcane mysteries of Dishonored, so this is not out of the question. Or perhaps it's a far more microscopic event, a simple act of influencing the lesser minds of the bipedal apes who traipse about the earth, sacking cities and burning temples in the names of a hundred right and a hundred wrong gods. With the information presented both in-game and externally, it's impossible to know. Though, if it turns out to be the latter, then that would certainly explain the motives behind the occult group that created the Outsider. But what if it turns out that the Void had no influence on this group? Then that begs the question, what did they hope to gain? What importance did they place on the Void? Well, consider the connection between the two worlds. We already know it's possible to see aspects of four-dimensional space represented in the Void. For instance, during Corvo's trip there, he witnessed many real-life events frozen in its gray expanse. These include the murder of Empress Jessamine Caldwin and the abduction of her daughter Emily. It doesn't take a high overseer to see the value in this. Knowledge is power, and he who controls the void would be capable of seeing every secret, every person, regardless of how protected or hidden away they may be. What happened to the occult group afterwards isn't known, though it's safe to say they failed at controlling the void or the outsider. Uniting with the Void gifted the Outsider with incredible power and preternatural long life. Though he appears to have limitless dominion in the four-dimensional universe, he in truth isn't omnipotent. He can't, quote, snap his fingers and cease to be or fundamentally change the cosmos, unquote. Nor does it seem as if he'd want to. The world is too curious a place, and like all curiosities, it begs to be examined. Though divorced from humanity, the Outsider still maintains an interest in the affairs of men. Not out of an emotional connection, mind you, but more out of a fascination born from his inhuman perception. Since merging with the Void 4,000 years ago, he's developed a habit of periodically appearing to men and women in need and bestowing upon them special abilities, marking them as his agents. These people, ostensibly, appear to be individuals suffering at the hands of the upper class. Though it's easy to read this as the outsider being just or fair, the real reason for his distribution of power is far more selfish. He is only interested in being entertained. Yes, his human form was tortured by the bourgeois and ruling classes, and yes, he still harbors bitterness towards them, but the outsider works against them solely because he knows that disrupting their system would lead to maximum entertainment value on his part. He cares little for the well-being of the humans involved. Live or die, it's all a matter of theatrics to him, which is why many parallel him to Loki. The outsider's mark is not a gift from an avenging angel. It's a possibility for change change born of high chaos or low chaos. According to Smith, the only thing which qualifies a bearer of the mark is if the outsider considers the candidate to be, quote, pivotal or potentially pivotal to history, unquote, and being, quote, in a position to affect many people or major events, unquote. For instance, sometime prior to the events of Dishonored, the outsider appeared to an unnamed child, colloquially referred to as Lonely Rat Boy. An impoverished citizen of Dunwall, this child existed during the time of the Rat Plague, and as such, his day-to-day -day life was out of fear and sadness, made ever worse by the corrupt officers of the City Watch. One day, after stumbling upon one of the Outsider's shrines, the Black-Eyed One appeared to him, gifting Lonely Rat Boy with his mark and power. 
The boy used his new abilities to confront his tormentors, summoning a swarm of rats to consume them. However, he was also bit during the encounter, and consequently contracted the plague. Lonely Rat Boy died a slow, painful death, thanking the outsider for the opportunity to live without fear, even if it was for just a short period of time. Based on the previous Smith statement, you can interpret this scenario two ways. Either Lonely Rat Boy failed to live up to his potential and died not putting the outsider's power to good use, or for as small a body count as he accrued, he actually did make a difference by managing to kill someone of historical significance. Maybe one of those officers would have grown to be an important general or an influential politician. There's no way to know for certain, but out of the two readings of this scenario, I'd like to believe it's the latter. Since the outsider does have some degree of prescience, it seems unlikely that he would choose a mark bearer that would fail him. Even with someone like Dowd, whom the outsider lost all interest in for a period of time, he eventually lived up to the potential that the outsider saw in him. Additionally, the outsider seems more invested in the affairs of men when his agents act in violence and destructive means. He obviously favors high chaos, as exemplified in the subtle ways he emotes, whether being his dry sarcasm or in the quiet subtext of his words. We witness this firsthand when Corvo employs more ruthless tools and powers in lieu of non-lethal ones. I don't know about you, Corvo, but I've had a lovely time. Intrigue and mystery, butchery and betrayal, the death throes of an empire. And you were an avenging spirit, spreading chaos at every turn. It's for this reason the Outsider seems to be more than a simple Loki analogy. As stated earlier, he is a hybrid of a couple different mythical figures. From the god of discord in his mischievous ways, to the anathema that is the Christian Satan. He also bears a similarity to another. The Outsider appears to be akin to something beyond human comprehension, operating with a sense of alien morality. Smith describes the Outsider as Chitonic. I'd say he's more Lovecraftian as he actually bears similarities to Nyarlathotep. For example, both characters frequently appear on Earth in the guise of a man. Both are deliberately beguiling and manipulative. Both are representatives of greater powers. And both desire more than the destruction of the world. The outsider craving chaos, Nyarlathotep craving madness. Additionally, Nyarlathotep's original short story describes him as a man who wanders the Earth, quote, gathering legions of followers to his demonstrations of strange and seemingly magical instruments, the narrator of the story among them. These followers lose awareness of the world around them, and through the narrator's increasingly unreliable accounts, the reader gets a sense of the world's utter collapse." Unquote. We can easily compare the magical instruments of Lovecraft's short story to the likes of the runes and bone charms of Dishonored. As exemplified by some of the in-game text, we know that they can effectively cause many who become exposed to them to lose awareness of the world around them. And of course, we get a clear picture of how the world is collapsing to the Rat Plague as Corvo cuts his way through the Empire's upper crust. Lastly, author Will Murray asserts that the image of Nyarlathotep appeared to the inventor Nikola Tesla in his dreams, and that this might have proved an inspiration for many of his experiments. In Dishonored, this is mirrored in the outsider appearing in the dreams of Piero Joplin inspiring him to construct the deathly mask Corvo Otano dons after joining the Loyalists. Aside from what Smith has revealed, and what we can glean from in-game info, little more is known about the Outsider. We already know that he has a habit of contacting people who can affect the flow of history, as exemplified by Piero and Lonely Rat Boy. But there are so few who can boast of actually meeting the Outsider, and even fewer who will truly bear his mark. In the time following the assassination of Empress Jessamine Caldwin, only a handful of people had been branded as agents of the Outsider. Dowd, my old friend, it's been a long while, but you've got my interest again. How the years pass and the bodies fall. Did you know that there are only eight like you in the world bearing my mark? We already know of the now deceased Lonely Rat Boy, and of course, Dowd and Corvo Otano. But there's also Delilah Copperstone and Vera More, more commonly known as Granny Rags. There's also an unnamed woman who, according to the Dunwall archives, was marked in the year 1803. A journal belonging to her son can be found, which details her abilities and her familiarity with the void. It states, At night, 
she told me of her dreams, of the empty place where the outsider whispered to her. With each visit, her craft grew until she could see through the eyes of moths and unlock a door or window hatch from outside a house. Her identity is unknown. These remaining mark bearers are also unknown. As with many of the dark gods in Lovecraftian lore, the outsider's relationship with humanity is raveled. There were those who would worship him and those who would deem his worship heresy. The Abbey of the Everman acts as the primary religious institution throughout the Empire of Crystal, created, quote, to protect the common people from the ravages of the outsider, unquote. The date of its establishment is unknown. However, the Dunwall archives chronicle the Abbey's construction in Dunwall as having occurred sometime between 1701 and 1708, with High Overseer John Clavering laying the foundation. In Southern Gristol, transpiring around the same time, the Overseers purged the lands of Whitecliffe, which had been a haven for witches, heretics, and thralls of the outsider. In 1711, the Abbey was named the State Religion, which officially kickstarted their campaign against the outsider's influence throughout the Empire. The Abbey has also attempted to extend their reach to the continent of Pandicia, a land that natural philosophers spoke of in reverent tones. The Abbey, on the other hand, looked upon the continent with far less deference, believing it a land of barbarism and heresy, where, quote, cults of submen engaged in brutal, perverse rituals, unquote. It is believed these rituals were conducted in the name of the outsider. Perception of the outsider's presence in Pandicia is reinforced by Sokolov's expedition to the supercontinent in the year 1808. And though not explicitly stated, it is believed that worship of bone charms and runes were a commonplace practice there, giving the Abbey further incentive to colonize. About once a generation, they would mount an effort to construct a permanent settlement there in order to enforce their notion of civilization on the peoples of Pandicia. And about once a generation, their efforts would be met with failure, Pandicia proving to be far beyond them, too vast and too great for conquest. Back in Gristol, the Abbey preached and taught against the workings of the outsider. These teachings included the seven strictures, the tenets of their religion, which seemed partly inspired by the seven deadly sins. Overseer Sturgis. My younger sister lives with my wife and me, but does not cook or clean. She thinks on curious subjects, machinery and numerical calculations. And only yesterday she spoke of a wish to read a book. What shall I do? This is very troubling. For such a young lady is easy prey to the outsider, if not already within his grasp. Watch her carefully for signs of it. She may fall into fits, or be heard speaking to the empty air, or laugh or cry without provocation. Perhaps a disfigured man may come and inquire after her, or you might discover small items in the house, branded as if by intense heat, or the bones of rats may be found in her bedclothes, be wary. Overseer Sturgis, is the outsider a winged serpent? Well, Coriander of Morley wrote that such serpents are kin to the whales and leviathans, and indeed sailors off the shores of Pandicia tell of great winged shapes seen circling far inland, if such reports are to be believed. But the outsider is something else, not of flesh. A being that haunts creation from first to last, incorporeal but not without force and influence. And so, briefly and in conclusion, not a winged serpent. In dreams, I have seen my hands raised against my own child. Has the outsider already corrupted me? In the life of High Overseer Perry, it is written that the great man conversed with the outsider in dreams, so it is true that he may walk there. But as to raising the hand, it is not always wrong to do so. I myself benefited by many a chastisement in my youth. Many indeed, and not lacking in enthusiasm. All vestiges of the outsider's worship were met with extreme hostility. Possession of shrines, as well as bone charms and runes, were deemed a criminal offense, which often resulted with punishment by death. The artifacts would be confiscated and brought to a warehouse found in the backyard of the office of the High Overseer, where they would be destroyed using an assortment of simple tools. Of course, that didn't always happen. As alluded to earlier, the charms have a glamour, a mystifying quality to them. Sometimes a hapless and weak-willed overseer would become ensnared by the charms. 
The body of one such overseer can be found in the supply depot in the backyard of the office of the high overseer, along with a note detailing his mania. It states, I managed to steal away one of the charms they were smashing in warehouse A. Smashing them. Such beautiful and powerful things that my brothers have no idea. They'll never find me back here though. Nobody ever comes back here. I can brick up the door and they'll never find me. It's all mine. Being the dominant religion of the land, the Abbey was quick to snuff out all traces of heresy. Yet, interestingly, and not surprisingly, Many high-ranking members of not just the Abbey, but the upper class, worshipped the outsider in secret. From High Overseer Campbell's possession of a room, to Sokolov's attempt at summoning the outsider, to the nameless nobleman purchasing black market charms in Sokonos, the outsider is welcomed into the hearts of those who fear and hate him most. The corruption and hypocrisy of the church doesn't stop there. It also extends to their means of deterrence, and how they combat the worship and employ of the outsider's gifts. An in-universe academic text called The Ancient Music details the existence of ripples in the natural world, stating that there is a, quote, 17-note scale derived from this phenomenon, and with the right equipment, those notes allow for astonishing effects. Not the least of these is the ability to calm the turbulence originating in the void which we attribute to the outsider, unquote. Using this text, the Abbey developed an anti-magic deterrent called Holger's device. Many believe the namesake of this technology was a reference to its inventor, but it's actually named after the founder of the Abbey, the Everyman, Benjamin Holger. The principles behind the device are scientific in theory, but are more akin to the notion of fighting fire with fire. According to the Music Bach notes, quote, it produces harmonies that render heretical energies, or magic, inert through counterbalancing mathematical principles. A sesquipedalian explanation meant to sound convincingly scientific. Yet in truth, Holger's device is actually just counteracting magic with magic, an ironic fact that has not been lost on many of the overseers. We cannot doubt the effectiveness of Holger's device, or the mathematical beauty of the music itself. We've seen it in action against the forbidden practices too many times to deny it. But the question no one wishes to ask is, is the incantation itself black magic? The boxes are priceless, but what's inside? In the end, though the Abbey considers the Outsider to be their greatest enemy, they are in truth at war with the Void, for the Void is the host of all of the Outsider's dominion. And though immensely powerful, the Outsider will one day die, killed in an unidentified catastrophic event. Of course he's already aware of this. Smith has stated, as a result of him, quote, being merged with the Void, he gets horrible glimpses of all time and space, unquote. As a result, it's safe to assume the Outsider has foreseen his own demise. What his response is to this knowledge, if he cares or not, is unknown. But considering he is an extension of what Smith refers to as the quote, uncaring or malevolent void, unquote, I don't imagine the Outsider gives it much thought. Either way, when he dies, the void shall remain in all its magic, in all its wonder and mystery. And so too the whales, beings of magic and wonder and mystery in their own right. How they tie together, well, that's a story for another episode.